start talking about our Leap Day celebration here. So I'm sure all of you wonderful educators are aware we do have Leap Day coming up here. This is once every four years, we get that extra day in February. Uh, and we were thinking, you know, how can we celebrate this? There's a lot of STEM tie-ins that you can do with a Leap Day celebration. Um, and we decided to take a slightly different path, uh, centering on uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, which is frogs. Uh, I actually used to be a research biologist studying amphibians, uh, decided to dress the part here today in my old fieldwork gear, which is now just hiking gear, but uh, still counts. Um, I actually used to do research in the exact area you see behind me here. Uh, this is the Muggian Rim in Arizona, and we studied frog populations and salamander populations in some of the ponds and little pools around this environment, much like this one that you can also see behind me. Both of these pictures are for me. So let's talk about how we tie in some of this STEM science content into our classroom. Um, I presume no one's going on a field trip to the uh, cliff sides of Arizona. Uh, if you are, that's amazing, but let's try to find something a little more accessible for most of you. Okay, now I know we've had this sort of out to the audience before, but if anybody's just come in or everybody's still thinking about this, um, I'd love to generate some ideas in the chat about leap activities, things that you could do with your class. Because uh, I'm sure as much as I love frogs and amphibian biology, maybe that's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, I see that we do have an option for a My STEM Kits lesson in the uh, chat already for adjusting jumps, which is a great idea. Um, is there anything else people thought of? Maybe not full activities, maybe just topic ideas, something that you could relate into Leap Day, something you might want to talk about with your class. Yep, we got in the chat connecting to telling time, why we have 365 uh, days, 24 hours in a day, absolutely. So there's the whole calendar and astronomy angle that you can take on this, which I think is probably the most typical approach, but super important, especially when we're learning you know, how we tell time and why we divide things into the kinds of subsections that we do. Why is a day 24? Why is a year 365 plus 0.25? Um, and then that, of course, leads also into fractions. So you can discuss quarter days. What do you do with a quarter day left over? Well, how do you add it up? How many days or how many years would that take to get to a full extra day, etc.? So you could do uh, some fraction activities in there, too. Um, we also have a, a plug for leap day birthdays and anniversaries in the chat, which is definitely an option. Um, lots of interesting people, I'm sure, that were born on Leap Day, although I don't know any of the top of my head. There might be something fun hiding out there that I don't know about. All right. If anybody has any other activity options or topic ideas that they want to post in the chat, feel free. I'm going to move on. But uh, I would definitely say if you're not into frogs, probably the calendars, the telling time, the fractions... Uh, would be a way to go as an alternative option here. All right, so let's talk about the activity that I've prepared for you today. In honor of Leap Day, we were thinking of, well, what leaps, what can we tie in here? And well, frogs are pretty good leapers. So we decided to make a little activity about those. Um, and as Hannah has already hinted in the chat, we have some lessons relating to uh, jumping or uh, like, throwing objects and doing some calculations, some statistics, some very introductory graphing activities along that same path. So we're going to tie these two things together. We're going to modify some things that we already have um, and make this just a little bit more friendly for Leap Day. So first of all, we're going to create a frog. So this is something you could do with your kids. I kind of targeted this towards um, sort of that middle to early elementary age group. I'm not sure how old people would get before they are no longer excited by designing a little jumping frog, but um, I think probably targeting at that middle elementary range would be pretty appropriate for the materials that I created today, um, but I don't have like a fully defined lesson plan with objectives and standards and all that. I just have some ideas for you. So we have two options here. You know, if you have attended any of our Mimeo STEM events before, um, you've probably heard that 
we're really big fans of 3D printing. And so I have a 3D print model of a jumping frog that you can download and use yourself. Um, and then we also have an alternative option for those of you who don't have a 3D printer or you just don't want to use it. Uh, we have a little jumping frog origami here that we can create as well. Now, full transparency here, I did not design either of these models. Um, I am certainly not the first to think of doing a jumping frog out of either of these mediums. So I just went to Thingiverse and looked to see if there was a jumping frog available. And what do you know, there's actually a few. Um, I chose this model here because I thought it looked the most like a real frog. Some of these other ones that kind of oval shaped are not exactly what I would call, you know, natural looking. Uh, this one appears to just be uh, like a trapezoid there. Uh, but this one stuck out to me as something pretty cool. And if you want to download this yourself, I'll put a link in the chat right now. So here is a link in the chat coming through to the same model of jumping frog that I used. Um, and this is attribution license. So I just want to point out that this was designed and created by Custom Proto on Thingiverse, not myself. Um, but really easy. If you haven't downloaded and used things from Thingiverse before, this is a free, free website that pretty much anybody can access. Um, I definitely would not recommend granting your students full access to this site, um, telling them to go browse for their own models, just because there are things here that are maybe not the most education appropriate. Anybody can put whatever they want up on Thingiverse. So it's a really good database, but it is not exactly child-friendly at all times. I think we're in pretty safe territory with a jumping frog, though. Now, once you find an object that you want to use in your own classroom, you want to print that yourself, uh, there's going to be a downloads button up here in the top corner. And it's just going to download what's called an STL file. Um, it might come in a zip or it might just come by itself, depending on how many files there are associated with that model. Now, once you have an STL file, you're going to have to decide what to do with it. Uh, so you can see in my downloads folder, I just got my jumping frog, open it up, dig for that file, and here's my STL. But if you are new to 3D printing, you might not know where to go with that one. And so the answer is to turn to what's called a slicer program. Now a slicer program takes this three-dimensional model and it turns it into something that a 3D printer is able to read. Um, and so I'll show you how to do that with our solution here, which is RoboCloud, again, a free website that links to our 3D printers. So let me close this STL here, and I'll go back to my web browser here, and I'll show you RoboCloud. You will need to create an account if you're going to uh, use RoboCloud, but like I said, that is a free website accessible to just about anyone. Um, and this will link with our 3D printers from the Mimeo STEM range. Now, I already uploaded this STL here, so you can take a look and see. Um, before I go into the details of how to print this particular model, does anybody see a potential problem with how this is going to print? Sometimes you need to manipulate files a bit. You see a potential problem here. Feel free to chime in in the chat. Yep, we got somebody who sees the issue right now in the chat. It is absolutely massive, right? This little red box here is actually the printable dimensions of my printer. Um, and you can see it is absolutely gigantic. I don't know uh, off the top of my head what uh, 282 millimeters is, but it's big. It's way too big for a jumping frog activity. This would be like uh, maybe a prehistoric jumping frog from long before you know, reptiles appeared and amphibians ruled the world. Uh, so that's probably not practical for most of you. And you probably don't have a 3D printer big enough to print this particular model. So we need to make a few adjustments. There's also one more adjustment that I'm curious if anybody noticed that you're going to want to change. So for now, let me start to create this model a little bit more practically. So the first thing we want to do is we want to resize it. Um, and I did a few tests here, and I found that about a 20% size turned out pretty well. It was a good size for decoration, for manipulation by small children, um, while not being so small that it is easily breakable. So we're going to just 
drag down our sliders here in the scale option in RoboCloud. I'm gonna drag it down to 0.2. And you can see, I'm not quite able to hit 0.2, but actually if I leave that slider selected and I use the keys, the arrow keys on my keyboard, you can see I can make fine scale adjustments. So if you haven't tried that already, that's a fun little option uh, to get the exact precise uh, percentage that you want when scaling objects. Uh, now, also Tana in the chat has solved the uh, little question I posed about what else we need to do to this particular model. Uh, we need to make it horizontal instead of vertical. Um, if you're familiar with how 3D printers work, uh, they, let me try to just position this a little bit better so you can see here, uh, they are going to lay down layer upon layer on this base plate of plastic and then build layers on top of pre-existing layers. And that works great for a lot of different geometries, a lot of different types of shapes, does not work really well for things like this overhanging foot or this overhanging head or the back little uh, ankle joint there, not gonna work at all with a 3D printer. You would have to add a lot of what are called supports, little columns that join these pieces together. Um, way too many to be practical, then you'd have to take a little needle nose pliers, break them all off uh, just to get to your activity. We don't really wanna do that. Uh, so when you get to a model like this, you can take a look at the geometry and the shape of this and decide what would be a more practical way to print this. Well, for this, we have, if you can see, the feet are a little bit thicker than the body. So the body's nice and springy and we have some feet as large platforms for our jumping frog to sit on. Uh, but we're gonna make it horizontal and we're going to actually lay it down onto the back side of the frog here. So in order to do that, instead of the scale tab in RoboCloud, we go over to our rotate tab um, and we actually are going to use the X rotation slider here. Uh, and again, we are going to rotate to rotate this little frog onto its back. We're going to do 90 degrees because we want it to just be flat to the platform. Now, to be sure uh, that it's actually on the base plate of my printer, uh, I also left this checkbox enabled here to snap to platform. So now you can see this frog is going to print a lot better. Uh, one more potential setting that you might want to adjust if you're doing this at scale for a lot of students in your class. If you switch over to print settings here on that tab, you can make the quality low quality. Um, this is actually going to be a pretty easy model to print. It's mostly the same type of layer. Every layer is almost the same shape. Um, and so there's not really a lot of variation there that you would need high quality print settings. So once you complete that, then you should be good to go in terms of printing. So once again, this link is in the chat. If you scroll up to uh, my message, you should be able to download this from Thingiverse. It's a freely available STL file for you. And just make those adjustments like I did and you should be good to go. Now, there is another option. Not everybody has or is able to use their 3D printer at the moment. I don't want to leave you out. I prefer the 3D printer version myself because it's a little bit more robust, um, a little bit easier for kids to make as well. Uh, but if you want to just do an origami lesson instead, we do have a jumping frog tutorial here. Um, I think the tutorial was pretty simple uh, in terms of how these lines fold over. Um, you will need to do some things like the water bomb base. If anybody's familiar with origami terms, you, you basically make a diagonal crease and a horizontal and vertical crease and fold that in to make a little triangle. It's probably one of the more complicated folds with this model, but it's not particularly challenging. And I will say it jumps really well and it looks pretty nice as well. There are other origami frogs out there, uh, but I picked this one because it's pretty simple and I think looks nice as well. So if anyone would rather just use paper, I'm gonna put that in the chat as well. Uh, obviously this model was not created by myself either. I think this is a pretty old origami model. I don't know who originally created it, but it's been around for a long time, at least as long as I have, because I remember creating it myself when I was a kid. All right. Now, we've got our model. Either we've created a 3D printed version, or we've done an origami lesson. And I think the next step is to decorate this thing. 
Um, it's always a lot of fun for kids. And of course, we can tie this into some actual science as to why frogs look the way they do. So I made a quick collection here of some tropical frogs here on the left and some more temperate frogs, frogs from maybe the US that your students might be a little bit more familiar with. Um, can anybody tell me in the chat what you notice? What's a, a major difference between these two groups? There's a few differences here, but let's see what you can notice. Yes, we've got a Preston in the chat, the color, exactly. Uh, the tropical frogs generally are much brighter, um, not 100% of the time, but uh, it's especially with the choices that I picked here. Um, Hannah suggests patterns. Yes, absolutely. We got a lot of stripes and sort of blotches over here, um, but more contrast, more intricate patterns on the left. Um, and size, Tana also says size, perfect. You came up with all the things that I was predicting. Um, and then also Preston asks, will one turn into a prince? Uh, Preston, if you wanna go ahead and print your own frogs and test that out, um, Go ahead. I know you have some daughters who might be interested in getting their own frog prints. Uh, let me know if that's successful because uh, we'll have to get our own. But let's take a look at some of these differences in a little bit more detail here. Uh, we already mentioned color. Um, so if you know anything about frog biology, um, there is something very important about some of these frogs here that might suggest why they are brightly colored. Um, some frogs have cryptic coloration. They like to hide. They want to be camouflaged in their environment so predators don't find them. Other frogs are the exact opposite. Uh, they want to be noticed because they're actually toxic. Some of these frogs here on the left, although not all of them, are actually quite poisonous and would kill an adult human if they were ingested to say nothing of something like a bird or a snake. So definitely want to stand out in their environment. Um, does anybody else know in the chat um, why some other color differences may exist. Poison is certainly not the only reason. Any other ideas? Yeah, Preston, you nailed it. Attracting mates. That's something that's also very important. A lot of animals have really bright coloration that doesn't really make sense if you're thinking about hiding from predators. I mean, peacocks are probably the prime example there. Um, a peacock is really doing a terrible job of hiding from predators, but they're doing a great job of standing out to their mates. Uh, so that is definitely something that matters, especially for this red-eyed tree frog here. Uh, definitely really important for its coloration because it's actually not poisonous. And then there is, of course, the uh, hiding from prey. Um, that's another option. So these frogs over here, they are gonna be blending into their environment good for hiding from predators who want to eat you. It's also good for hiding from things that want to avoid you. So if you look like a lump of dirt or a bit of weed, that helps a lot when stalking things that often have very good eyes, like a lot of insects have really good eyes that can attune to those colors. So that definitely helps. Um, and as Hannah said in the chat, yes, this is an excellent time to tie in uh, science standards. Uh, you can talk about natural selection, you can talk about coloration and camouflage. Uh, and so there's really a lot that you can do with these little frogs that we're creating. Now, I went ahead and created a few of these frogs in advance. Um, they took about 20 minutes to print a piece. So if you're looking at a, a target there, um, you may want to use that just as a, a ballpark figure here. Um, I went ahead and created like this red-eyed tree frog, the strawberry poison dart frog, the uh, Panamanian golden frog, and then a wood frog over here. Um, I didn't have light blue filament, but there is a light blue poison dart frog that would be also excellent at creating with the 3D printer. And in order to do this, all I'd used was Sharpie and some paint pens. So acrylic paints work the best at decorating 3D prints. Uh, they will uh, adhere to that plastic material very well. Uh, but I don't want to assume that everybody has a set of acrylic paints out and ready to go for their classroom. It's kind of messy, might not be the most accessible option, uh, but permanent marker, and in this case, also some paint pens for more of those brighter colors worked pretty well. The other thing that I did when printing these was if you're able to see, um, there's a little bit of a pattern on some of these. You can see a few diagonal lines that are on my frogs here, and it actually caused some smudging on the eyes 
Um, that's because I used a raft to print these as well. Uh, so when you're getting ready to 3D print them, you rotate them onto their back. Uh, and I had to use a raft to adhere them to the printer plate. Uh, depending on your printer, how it's adjusted, whether you have any glue or anything like that to help with the printing process, you may not need a raft. Uh, but just be aware, if you do include a raft, uh, you'll probably have a few diagonal lines on the top of your frog. Not a really big idea, uh, big deal for coloring, but something to keep in mind. Um, so I created a few different varieties here. Um, and Rebecca asks in the chat, can I repost the link for printing the frogs? Absolutely, I can. Oh, and Hannah beat me to it before I even pressed Command V. Way to go, Hannah. Uh, so here are a few of my options that I created. Yeah, you can also see I experimented with size a little bit. So if you are doing a science lesson with your students, not only could you decide what color you want to print, you know, obviously I use different color filament for these frogs, uh, but you can also decide how you want to decorate them. Maybe pick a species of frog that the student wants to create, or, you know, maybe they create their own, um, a sort of a generic green frog with a camouflage pattern of their own, or maybe they invent a poison dart frog. Um, but then the other thing that you could do is you can vary size. And you could even test which size jumps best. You know, I picked 20%, but I think you could probably vary that up to 30, down to 10, maybe. I believe this little guy was 15%. Um, so your choices are pretty wide open there in terms of how you want to adjust things. Uh, but I would encourage you, if you're doing a STEM-focused lesson, build in some hypothesis testing. Have students make a prediction, like bigger frogs, larger legs, they'll jump farther. Or maybe lighter frogs that are smaller will jump farther. You never know. So, so many possibilities in terms of how you would want to alter these designs to fit the lesson that you're targeting. Um, and of course, we also have our little origami frog in here as well. These are going to be a little harder to vary unless you use different size paper. Uh, but of course, you can still color and decorate as you need. Uh, now, once they're all done, of course, you can test them out. So let's line up some frogs here. Um, I brought out my little cutting mat here with built-in inch and uh, you know measurements there. And if I push down, you can see it actually covers the entirety of my mat. Um, it jumps really well. So you may want to get a little measuring stick. Maybe a, a meter stick would be a good option here. I don't think it's going to jump longer than one meter stick. These are not you know launching frogs. Uh, but they're pretty good. Um, I've also noticed at least for adult size fingers, you probably want to use the side of your finger on that little tab on the bottom, just because um, a full finger is a little too wide to just target the little jumping tab. Uh, a child size finger probably won't have any issues. Just push down and away it goes. Uh, the origami frog jumps a little higher, but it doesn't jump as far, but still a lot of fun. Uh, question in the chat, could you use a pen if your fingers are too large for the frog you printed? Absolutely. Uh, probably a pen would be better than a pencil because I feel like a pencil might snap if you push on it wrong. Uh, but yes, you could use something smaller to get to that little tab. Um, and then if you, maybe your students aren't quite as you know powerful at jumping compared to my hands, I'm not sure. Uh, but we even have some materials available for you to do a quick lesson and build in some of that graphing content and measurement. Um, so there's actually a lesson, you know, Hannah has been mentioning several lessons out there, uh, but we have a lot of jumping and launching and sort of measuring type activities on mystemkits.com. So if you're familiar with that site, um, if you're a member, um, you can go and uh, load up some of these lessons that you can adapt very easily to this frog type activity. Now, this is a catapult kit. Um, I think you can see the similarities in my thought processes here. This is launching a projectile, uh, but the frog is also jumping. And if we scroll down, you can see all the lesson plans that would relate to the catapult in this case. Many of these also would relate to the frog lesson. Uh, so I just picked one here. Hannah has mentioned a few in the chat so far, uh, but I looked at the landing zones lesson because I thought it was, you know, it's that middle elementary level. It's a, it's about a third grade lesson here. Um, and I actually downloaded this lesson so you can see the kinds of things that you're able to uh, get with a My STEM Kits membership here. Um, you've got a description of your lesson. You've got standards and objectives, all the background information you could need. 
um, and then even some resources for you. So we've got this PDF that you just saw from my uh, little printout here. Uh, depending on the scale of your frogs, you might be able to even use this page as your jumping measurement um, instead of converting from a meter stick. Um, and then we even have some student activities and handouts that come right with this lesson. Um, for example, I put in a little PowerPoint uh, this was originally a catapult design over here, but I just added a free icon from PowerPoint, and now we have a frog jumping lesson. Really easy. Um, took me about like three seconds to create this lesson from the built-in materials from my STEM kits. All right. So the last thing, I don't think we have time today to actually run a full jumping lesson, but you can get an idea of the kind of data that you'll get because I created one myself. Um, this is the landing zones lesson, and you can see I had a few different frogs trying this out, testing the zones that they landed in, and counting how many times it landed in the zone. I have to admit, this is randomized data. Uh, I did not actually run this experiment this many times, um, but you know, with your students, you'll actually get data who looks like this. Um, now, I find that this bar graph here is a little hard to read. Um, I did color code it, so golden frog is yellow, strawberry frog is red, etc., uh, but it's still hard to tell which frog is the best jumper. You might be able to guess, uh, but it's kind of messy. So if your students are up for it, doing some st simple statistics, I took the average distance. So I just calculated here the average from these columns and graphed it again. And now it's much more obvious the strawberry frog is, in this case, the winner. Um, also, coincidentally, my favorite amphibian. So way to go, strawberry dark frog. Uh, probably not realistic at all that it would will win this contest, but in our randomized data set, it comes out the champion. So that is our frog lesson for you. Hopefully that gave you some ideas, if not a direct applicable uh, lesson for you and your students. But I had a lot of fun playing around with some of these options, uh, thinking through what you would need to do to make this more practical in your classroom. Um, and again, if you need those files or links, they're in the chat here. Uh, if you're watching a recording as well, I'm sure this will be posted in the description on YouTube uh, with all the links that you need. Um, if you are able to, I'd love to invite all of you back for February 28th, our next STEM Wednesday session, uh, where Preston, who's been a great contributor in the chat so far today, uh, will be back for uh, coding and MyBot exploration. So that should be really fun. Uh, take a look at another side of STEM. Um, but that's what we've got. If there's any further questions, I can hang out for a few more minutes. But thanks, everyone, for your attendance.